we tend to celebrate things for a day and then move on, whether that's a birthday or an anniversary or an award that we might receive. We celebrate it for a time, a very short period of time, and then we move on with life. The earliest Christians, however, realized that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not something that we want to celebrate for a day or even two or three. It's something for Christians to celebrate every day of their life because Jesus lives and rules. He lives and rules today. And so on this Sunday, we have an opportunity to continue rejoicing over the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, specifically to rejoice in the resurrection testimony. May the Holy Spirit fill you with confidence and joy over that truth this morning and lead you to rejoice. A good morning and a welcome to each and every one of you. Today's order of worship is uh, from the hymnal, page 38. We join now in the opening hymn. <laughs>
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and also with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children, but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are they who take refuge in him. Your word, O oh Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues forever. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are they who take refuge in him. Let us pray. O risen Lord, you came to your disciples and took away their fears with your word of peace. Come to us also by your word and sacrament and banish our fears with the comforting assurance of your abiding presence. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. On this second Sunday of Easter, our first lesson is from the book of Acts, chapter 2. Filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, Peter boldly confesses the, before the people of Jerusalem and proclaims Jesus as the risen Savior. The suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus were not chance history, but occurred by God's set purpose and foreknowledge in perfect fulfillment of the scriptures. Peter witnessed the risen Lord Jesus. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Here ends the first lesson. The psalm of the day is number 16. We'll join together in singing it after an introduction.
Today's second lesson is 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. Again, we hear Peter's words regarding Jesus' resurrection. As believers in the resurrection, we now have a living, sure hope in our own resurrection. That hope fills us with comfort in all of our sufferings. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Here ends the second lesson. Alleluia, alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. These words are written that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son. Holy Gospel according to St. John, chapter 20. John gives us the account of Jesus' appearance to his disciples without Thomas on Easter evening and to the disciples with Thomas a week later. Thomas refused to believe unless he could see and touch the Savior as proof of his resurrection. Jesus graciously gave him that opportunity. This reading will serve later as our sermon text. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of our Lord. Children, I've got a message I've prepared for you today. If you're sitting far away from the screen, you might want to come a little closer, step a little closer for me. Raise your hand if you like to eat hot dogs. I've got one here. Maybe you put ketchup and mustard on it, and maybe some onions. Or maybe you put chili on it with cheese. They're really good, and you probably like to eat hot dogs. This is a regular-sized hot dog here. 
Can you imagine, can you, could you guess at what the biggest hot dog ever made was? How big? Use your hands. Do you think the hot dog was about this big? Or was it this big? Or was it this big? That's a pretty big hot dog. I've got a picture I want you to take a look at. You see that hot dog? At one time, at least, that was the biggest hot dog ever in the world. I don't know if it still is or not. That's a really big hot dog. Would you believe, before you saw that picture, would you have believed that that is the biggest hot dog in the world? Would you have believed that there was a hot dog that big? Maybe, but maybe not. But now that you saw it, you know it's true. Jesus wanted all of his followers, everybody, to know that yes, he had died on Good Friday on the cross, but he had risen from the dead. He was alive on Easter. And he came to his disciples and he showed them, I'm alive, I'm not dead anymore. And they saw it and they believed. But there was one disciple who wasn't there. You heard about it a little bit earlier. His name was Thomas. Thomas said, unless I see Jesus, I am not going to believe that he is alive. And a week later, Jesus showed himself alive to Thomas. Take a look at the picture that I've got there for you. It's a drawing of Jesus, the other disciples, and Thomas. He's actually touching Jesus. And then Thomas said, now I believe it. You are alive, Jesus. You're my Lord and my God. You are my Savior. You have that very same faith as Thomas does. You believe Jesus is alive, that he died again and that he rose again. But have you ever seen Jesus with your eyes? I haven't. Neither of you. We will when we get to heaven. And yet you and I believe Jesus is alive. Jesus said about that, he said, blessed are you, happy are you. You are wonderfully gifted by me if you believe that I'm alive, even though you haven't seen me. What a wonderful thing that is because that's how we are saved. That's where we have our forgiveness. Jesus, who is alive, forgives us all of our sins and assures us we're going to go to heaven. And in fact, he assures us that on the last day, we too will rise, just as he did. Jesus is alive. Even though you haven't seen him, you believe it. How wonderful that is. That concludes my children's message. We'll now join together in the hymn of the day.
Christ is not, is not here. He has risen just as he said. Grace be to you in peace from God our Father and from our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, your Christian friends. That's it in a nutshell. I'm fairly certain you've heard that phrase before and have probably used it more than a few times in your life. In a nutshell, this is it. But did you know that that phrase is almost as old as the words of our text from John chapter 20? With a minimal amount of digging around on Google, I found out that this phrase, in a nutshell, was actually used first by a Roman writer named Pliny, who died in the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD. Two years prior to that, Pliny was giving his opinion on the Iliad. And he wrote his comments very briefly. And he said, this is it in a nutshell. In other words, he was saying his comments about this Iliad were so brief they could be contained in a nutshell, if that were possible. And ever since then, people have been borrowing his phrase to indicate that these are their brief comments, whether it's about a problem, about a celebration, about some event, something important in their life. This is it in a nutshell. A week ago, you joined Christians around the world in celebrating Easter in a way that you never thought you would. And probably in a way you hope you never will have to again. You were apart from one another, but the media covered it showing this is how Christians around the world are celebrating Easter, and that brought great joy to your heart and mind. And I may be a little optimistic, but I think if you asked any Christian, what is Easter all about? They would be able to tell you it's about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. That's what Christians celebrate on Easter. And I might be a little pessimistic, but if you ask those same Christians, well, what does that mean for you? I think too many Christians would struggle to give you an answer, at least an answer that's biblically correct. But how about you? If you were asked, what is Easter all about in a nutshell, how would you answer that? Well, if you listen carefully to the gospel that was read earlier, or if you looked at your service folder and noticed what the worship theme is, you would easily be able to answer, it's about peace. And that's the truth. In a nutshell, Easter is peace. But just what kind of peace are we talking about? And what are we to do with it? Follow along with me as we focus on this account of the resurrection of Jesus on Easter evening and the effect that had on his followers. This past week, I happened to listen to several Easter sermons online, and I think that in every one of them, I heard something about threats, and that's only natural. We're living in a time that is very threatening to people, not only here in the United States, but throughout the world. And if you aren't threatened by what's happening, you're either too young to know it, or your mental limitations aren't allowing you to be aware of it. We're all aware of the threat that's out there. The followers of Jesus felt threatened too. They know how you feel. Did you hear about that threat, that how they felt about things in the reading earlier? Let me remind you. Our text says, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews. Did you catch it? In a day and age when people probably left their doors wide open, they had the doors of that place, that home, locked down tight. Why? For fear of the Jews. Well, what did they have to fear from their fellow Jews? Well, actually, it wasn't all of the Jews that were causing them fear. It was a certain subset of them. It was the powerful Jews, the ruling Jews, that they were afraid of. Well, what had happened? Well, Recall that there were Roman soldiers posted at the tomb of Jesus. And the Bible tells us that when the angels appeared to roll away the stone, the soldiers, the Roman soldiers, were filled, filled with fear. They saw the tomb opening up. They saw the angels rolling away the stone, and the tomb was empty. And what did they do with that? They were eyewitnesses that the tomb was empty. What did they do with that information? Scripture says they went back to the 
Jewish rulers and told them what had happened. An angel came and rolled away the stone and the tomb's empty. And the Jewish rulers said, here, we're giving you this money. You are to tell anyone who asks that the disciples came and stole the body of Jesus. What an, a very grave charge. Opposing the Roman government because that tomb had been sealed with Pilate's seal. Opposing the Roman government? That's the story that was being spread out there? The Jews were afraid. These disciples were afraid. But what else was going on in their hearts and their minds? Well, recall what had happened just in three short days. Many of these people had followed Jesus around for three years. They had heard the things, the teachings that Jesus had shared. They had witnessed his miracles. They had pinned their hopes on Jesus as being the Messiah that God had promised to send the Jews for centuries. And then he was dead. He was gone. What's more, he had told them that just when he needed them most, they would all flee from him. And even though they denied it, that's exactly what had happened. And for most of them, that was the last time they had spoken to Jesus. That's the last time they had seen Jesus alive. And now here they were, miserable followers of Jesus. But then the report started coming in. The women claimed to have seen Jesus alive, and Peter had seen him too early that morning. And now it was about 12 hours later, and they were just uncertain what to make of all this. Jesus was dead. They were sure about that. But now these people were telling them that he was alive. They were confused on top of their fear and their disappointment in themselves. And then it happened. Jesus came and stood among them. And this is what he said. Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you twice in a matter of minutes. He says, peace be with you. That's Easter in a nutshell. But just what kind of peace is Jesus talking about? Well, first and foremost, he's speaking about the peace that he had come to establish between sinful people and the holy God. The whole reason Jesus took on human flesh and blood and came to this earth at Christmas and then went to Calvary's cross on Good Friday was to pay the penalty, was to suffer the punishment for the sins of all people of all time. Jesus had done that. He shouted, it is finished from the cross, and his resurrection now proved was the guarantee that the Father had accepted that payment for sin. And so now there was no longer sin barring us from presence in the Holy God. Our relationship with the Holy God was restored. Peace, peace with the Holy God. The Jewish word for peace is shalom. It's likely that's what Jesus said to his disciples. And shalom is still the common Jewish greeting, peace. But when Jesus said it on this Easter evening, it wasn't simply a greeting. No, this was the gospel. This was the good news about Jesus as the Savior from sin. It was the gospel, the gospel which works faith in a person's heart and sustains and nourishes that faith. And with that faith, it brings with it the gift of the forgiveness of sins, which brings us peace with the holy God. It actually brings peace to sinners. And that's Easter in a nutshell. Peace. Peace received. Our account tells us that one of the disciples, Thomas, was not there. And for a week, he lived without that peace. He was left out. Do you ever feel left out of the peace of Easter, the peace which God wants you to have? Well, not as we sit and listen to the Easter account. We're filled with joy. We know that we have peace with God, but it won't be long before the spiritual warfare starts within you and suddenly the peace disappears. 
Which of us hasn't experienced some disappointment or disaster or even tragedy in our lives and wondered, God, what do you have against me now? There goes the peace. Or which of us hasn't been filled with self-loathing after we have promised ourselves, I'm not going to fall into that sin again. And then it happens. In spite of our best intentions. Or who hasn't been crushed with guilt? When we know there is something we ought to say or something we ought to do to help our fellow Christian, but we don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to damage our relationship. So instead, we'll just think about ourselves rather than about them. And we'll fail to do what our Savior has called us to do. And the guilt crushes us. The spiritual warfare that occurs within every one of us. And if I haven't hit on your particular one, I'm sure you know it all too well. That's because that's the way we are. By nature, we doubt the peace. We feel left out. But that's why Easter is such good news. Jesus comes and the first thing he says to his followers who had disappointed him so dismally, who had been anything but stellar followers of Jesus, he comes to them and he doesn't bang on them for their sins. He comes to them and he says, peace. And he says it twice. That's Easter in a nutshell. Peace. Peace received. I heard it this past Thursday on a public service announcement on a television. It was the picture of medical science, and it said, science is going to win. And I understood that message, and I'm glad that it was proclaiming that, that we're going to use science to overcome, to finally find out what it will take to overcome this pandemic. But science isn't God. And science, while it's a tremendous blessing from God, doesn't have all the answers, doesn't have all the solutions. I hope and pray that it finds a solution to this pandemic, but it won't be the last thing, the last problem that we're going to need science to address. In fact, there will always be problems. This world will be full of problems until the Lord Jesus returns. And that's why Jesus did not send his followers out with an advanced degree in science. He sent them out as they were, his disciples, with the gospel. And he did it like this. He said, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. First of all, he made a special point of sending his followers out with the power of the Holy Spirit. Rest assured, these followers already had the Holy Spirit living in them. That Holy Spirit had created saving faith in Jesus. He was with them already. But now Jesus makes a special point of placing the Holy Spirit on them as he confers on them an office, a position of serving other people. And that office involved sharing the peace of Easter, sharing the forgiveness of sins, the peace that Jesus had given them through the gospel and which they believed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was now using them to share with others. He said, go out and tell people your sins are forgiven by the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And notice that he didn't limit that office that responsibility, that service to just a select group. He gave it to one and all of his believers. If you have the peace of Jesus through the forgiveness of sins, then Jesus is placing, has placed you into that office as well. You have the peace of Jesus in your heart to share that peace with anyone and everyone you meet. That's a peace that never runs out. It springs eternally from an empty tomb outside of Jerusalem. From that day on, that peace had begun flooding over the world and it has reached you. And now Jesus is using you to share it with others. That's Easter. Easter, in a nutshell, is peace. 
peace we've already received and peace now for us to share so what do people today need more than ever well many will answer answer that with a vaccine a job food normalcy in their lives and I get it earthly speaking physically speaking that is what people need but no matter what the problem in life no matter what the tragedy or what the pandemic is our greatest problem is still sin and that makes our greatest need the forgiveness of sins and Jesus won that for us Easter is the guarantee that we have that forgiveness and we have what people need more than all the peace of Christ and he calls us into his service and what an opportunity we have with a fretting friend or relative or co-worker people who are distraught over what they're facing we know what that's like we're in it with them as the announcements have told us time and time again we're all in this together but we have something they need more than all the peace of Christ and because Christ is risen it's going to be okay everything will be okay not just okay but perfect because that's what a risen Savior promises and he guarantees it to us Easter in a nutshell is peace enjoy that peace and share it amen the peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus amen having heard the word of our God we now make confession of the Christian faith using the Apostles Creed I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth I believe in Jesus Christ his only son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified died and was buried he descended into hell the third day he rose again from the dead he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty from there he will come to judge the living and the dead I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please join your hearts with mine in the responsive prayer of the church for Easter. O Lord God, our strength, our song, and our salvation, you fulfilled your promises by the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, from the dead. Thanks be to God. You give us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In your compassion, you sent Christ, the Good Shepherd, who laid down his life to rescue the lost. Drive out all doubt and gloom, that we may delight in your glorious triumph. Lift our eyes heavenward to see him who lives to make intercession for the saints, 
and grant us confidence in the greatness of his power. Keep before us the vision of your redeemed people, standing before your throne and singing the song of victory. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive wisdom and power and honor and glory and praise. Make us instruments of your peace as we bring the good news of hope and new life to those around us. Guide us in the use of all that you have entrusted to us, our time, our talents, and our treasures. Risen Lord, live in us that we may live for you. Merciful Lord Jesus, grant healing to the sick and strengthen the faith of the suffering and the dying. Assure them of your abiding presence and comfort them with the hope of eternal life. O oh Lord God, we bow before you in this time of national discipline. We trust your promises that even when you discipline us, your purposes are loving and good. Be present with your strong comfort among those most directly affected by this calamity. And in your mercy, make shattered lives whole again. Strengthen doctors, nurses, paramedics, and all those who are assisting the sick and the dying. Use this tragedy to make us as a nation deeply aware of our total dependence upon you. In the days ahead, endow the governors of our states with wisdom. May the decisions that they make be for the good of all people. Give us courage to face whatever the future holds, knowing that our future and we ourselves are in your hands. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Gracious Father, you have restored to us the joy of your salvation. With happy hearts we come before you and say, Alleluia, thanks be to God, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We continue with the singing of the next hymn.
I'll speak the prayer and the benediction. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Our closing hymn is stanzas one and four. Again, a good morning to all of you. Thanks for taking the time to join with me virtually in worshiping our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's my prayer that this video and the word of God that was shared here, the hymns and the prayers, uh, served you spiritually, increasing your faith in your Savior, Jesus Christ, as the risen Lord, and also giving you the comfort of knowing the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, the peace that God now has given you also to share. I just have a couple of announcements. As the bulletin states, the council has decided to cancel the April voters meeting, which was going to be held next Sunday. The Women's Guild will, not also, will also not have their quarterly meeting as well. Next Sunday, I'll be uh, distributing the uh, Mar uh, May ca church calendar and the May uh, newsletter. There may be some information by that time about some of the things we plan here in May, depending on Governor DeWine's directives this week. Uh, things like confirmation. Uh, we had talked about having a May 17th open forum. Uh, things like that. Uh, hopefully we'll have some uh, news for you on those things next Sunday. 
Finally, this is usually the Sunday in which we show the Wells Connection. The Synod has made that Wells Connection available as a link to everyone, and I will be sending that link out to you in a day or two. God bless you. If you need me in, at all, any of my services, please call my cell phone, 937-623-7541. God bless your day.